walking in the alleys, testing concepts. Um, powerful way, we find walking is a really powerful way to be present in a space, truly experience and connect with it. It also can be a way to ephemerally connect disparate spaces by stitching them together, free walking between them. We listen, one-to-one uh, -one meetings, group conversations, we have an online contact form on the website, listen to each other. Our most creative ideas come when we're walking along in an alley, chatting to each other or others when that's allowed. Uh, gathering information through desktop research, looking at toolkits, academic research, blogs, archives, evaluations, all sorts of you know, things from all over the world, looking at alleyways. We share our findings through stories, through data, images, um, you know, we're sharing things, things we're finding uh, through our website, through social media and through festivals like this one. And we've been creating our own content, uh, writing on the journal on our website, uh, looking now to more formal publications, photography, mapping, illustrating concept designs, um, all based on our listening and observing. Uh, and we're also piloting some concepts, which we'll hear a little bit more about later. So alleys or entries come in different various shapes and forms, and they're generally subcategorized as follows. Adopted, meaning that the land has been adopted but isn't owned by the Department of Infrastructure, and these are generally maintained by the City Council, but not always. They're treated like an extension of the public footpath. And there's unadopted alleys, meaning that they um, usually sit outside of any kind of maintenance or gating schemes. Uh, some of which have therefore become quite overgrown, like this one you see in the picture. The term unadopted can come across as slightly negative, but we see these as areas of potential in the cities as a potential to do so much more for local residents. And lots of Belfast alleyways have also been gated off, both formally and informally, sometimes to keep people out, but we've also seen instances that alleys have been gated to keep people or animals in, and some mostly adopted alleyways have official gates. Only key holders can open them and it, you only get a key if you live backing onto that alley. So if you use it, if you lose it, you have to pay 20 pounds to replace it. And we've heard of many renting tenants who don't have a key and who struggle to get their bins in after bin day, never mind make more use of their alley. But gates do also do have their advantages, which we'll get to in a moment. That last slide was an example of the official Delta City Council gates, but this is an example of an unofficial gate that's been put on by local residents. Mostly, you find these mostly on the unadopted alleys, um, and many of them, like this one you see, remain open and accessible to all. So while there's a gate there, uh, they're unlocked. You can get through it. It's still a barrier delineating a transition from one space to another, but one you can get through. We recognise the demand for alley gates to reduce antisocial social behaviour and fly tipping and to make them feel safer. They make the alley an enclosed space and make a lot of residents feel more secure in the knowledge that non-residents can't access the back of their house. They've also been instrumental in allowing some community-led developments to take place like Wildflower Alley, which is in the image here, and Ardmore Rossmore, which is another one that you might have seen in local newspapers um, and on TV over the last few months. And these success stories are always community-led, bottom-up, cohesion is key, and it takes some committed individuals to make this sort of thing happen. However, it's also a shame while Flower Alley has become a tourist attraction. Travel and culture website Ireland Before You Die lists it as one, as one of Belfast's five prettiest streets, but tourists can't get to it because of the gates. Often people are asking for gates because of fly tipping, but we have seen that the gates don't always work to reduce fly tipping. Um, the dumping can still happen inside the gates. And uh, so the gates have been described by people during our research as a panacea, a sticky plaster, a confidence builder that doesn't necessarily deliver. Uh, we know that these gates are expensive. There are currently 1,066 of them in Belfast. They cost our city 3,000 pounds each. That's 3.2 million pounds before you get into the planning, the keys, the maintenance, and all the other costs associated. Uh, a further phase of alley gates is in planning with the budget set aside from our city's rates at the moment. So, uh, so, and then some alleys need five or more gates. Um, and then ownership can be a huge issue. In some instances, it will be easy to identify who owns an alleyway, but not always. Land registry in Northern Ireland holds records of land ownership and you have to pay, or you can pay to conduct a public research there. However, until quite recently, alleyways didn't have to be registered with the land registry, so a lot of land is still unaccounted for. We'd recommend that you look at original land leases, which if you're a homeowner, your solicitor will have access to. It should state if you own part of the alley or if you have a right of way across it. 
and then some alleyways are owned by each of the neighbours. This means that you'd be held responsible for the land directly at the back of your own property, as in the picture in the right there. But it's not as black and white as this, though, because in my own alleyway, some of the neighbours own the bits behind their houses and others don't. And although they all do have right away over the parts that are owned by neighbours, my solicitor says this is not unusual or uncommon. And sometimes the owner of one property owns all of the alleyway. This leads to all kinds of barriers, only some physical to transforming alleyways. In some cases, you might be able to see remnants of um, ownership left over, like the picture on the left, um, which is a bit of fenced off alleyway. And um, yes, the lease on the right shows how the boundary stretches into the alleyway. Alleys have really come into their own over the last year, in particular as places to encounter neighbours to exercise, to grow things for safe off street places for kids to play, shorter routes for May to be, just escaping in whatever way you can beyond the four walls of home during lockdown. Uh, we see the alleys as a really great asset in this regard and have been gathering stories from across Belfast of the good, the bad, the ugly, the challenges, the opportunities, speaking to councillors, Belfast City Council staff, residents of streets backing onto alleys. This picture is of the 2020 Alleyway Athletics and a quote from a resident uh, saying, during lockdown in the summer, I wanted the kids to still have a sports day, even though the schools were shut. We organised a socially distant Alleyway Athletics. The alleyway was the perfect location, wide enough to stay apart and free from traffic, apart from the odd van now and again. Now kids can't play in the streets safely. Alleyways are the perfect location for them to play. And these images show an alleyway that changes with the festivity. Um, here we have a Halloween spectacular and a Christmas alley walk. A resident said, in lieu of trick-or-treating, we organised a neighbourhood spooky parade installation for the kids, where the entire street chipped in with more than 30 mini installations along the route and an overwhelmingly amazing collective effort that was safe for everyone. This is the story of a lockdown lane, a resident says, when we were thinking of selling our house, I used to bring prospective buyers out there and say, you know, I would never have thought when I bought this house, but this space has been such an asset. We didn't end up moving. You see, our red brick terrace has only a yard, so the lane has provided so much more space, and with six kids, we have gratefully spilled out into it. And these images are part of the Christmas endeavours by Open Ormo. They say, we believe that a community is nothing without its people. And it's in the relationships between those people where a community really comes to life. By providing community events and projects, we want to give a space for people to engage, whether by getting involved or in organising or by taking part so that everyone can really feel a part of a thriving community. We love their festive nights. Then the city centre at Nine Foot and Common is very much focused on the residential alleyways, but we just wanted to touch on the huge investment that there's been in Belfast's entries in the commercial core. Belfast Entries Project is a regeneration project worth £870,000, funded by Belfast City Council and Department for Communities. It's been breathing life into the city centre entries and increasing their permeability. We would love to see this kind of vision of increasing permeability built out across the city. Uh, this latest programme has been beautifully managed by Daisy Chain Inc, along with Form Native and Urban Seal Interventions. Um, the scheme introduces lighting, interpretive panels and around 30 artworks, two of which you see here. On the left is Pottinger's Entry, a piece by Irony, and on the right, uh, Wilson's Court, a piece by Rob Hilkin, photographed by Neil Campbell. Uh, these before and after shots really emphasise the potential of public artwork to transform and elevate spaces. We've seen some of this in alleys too, and uh, there'll be a little bit more about that later as part of Lemon Alley. And from the strategically programmed to the, to the grassroots, we were lucky enough to experience this art exhibition in an alleyway off Ravenhill Road last year. And there we met Maeve, the curator behind it and Lemon Alley. These pics are by Neil Campbell as well. The artwork pictured is by Maeve herself, by Donald Billings and Jonathan Brennan. And our conversations with Maeve have progressed over the last few months. And we now find ourselves working in partnership on Lemon Alley. We're gonna show you some of our work that's included in Lemon Alley before introducing you to Maeve. So this is a poster you may recognise, the uh, Georgian Doors of Dublin that you used to pick up in museum shops and you know, postcards, posters of it. Um, we love the format and uh, as imitation is the highest form of flattery, we have made our own version using the gritty and the pretty back streets of Belfast. Uh, you can see the impact that personalising your own back kit can have and we discovered yesterday we weren't the first people to draw this comparison um, and it's uh, yeah it's, the, the comparison has made, been made before of the, the Belfast back alley in all their colour 
versus the Georgian source of Dublin. Um, yeah. uh, and here we've got another version, Growing Wild in the Alleys of Belfast. We invite you to play Wildflower Bingo uh, with daffodils, nettles, moss. Can you find five in a row on your alley walk? What colour is your alleyway? Uh, we wanted to sell the myth that alleyways are grey, soulless places. This palette is a way of communicating the potential for growth, the softness, the warmth. Um, apparently, alleyways have their own microclimate, according to Connor from Social Farms and Gardens. And there's so much already growing in alleys, from thin strips of grass to trees to things growing out of the cracks and brickwork. We have been questioning if there are other ways that money could be spent to make alleys cleaner and safer and whether big lockable gates are the best solution? Are there other ways to make these spaces into places that are used and loved? Or things that you can do while you wait for gates? The following are some ideas that we're exploring that people can do as a, a small first step in their own space as an alternative to the Belfast City Council gates or while they wait for them. And we're using the festival as a chance to pilot some of these concepts, like this one, what's around the corner? A corner mirror to allow views from the street along the alley. It's an antisocial behaviour deterrent, promotes a feeling of safety and makes it more exposed and less appealing for hanging out to get up to no good. And this one here, exploring the idea of how you could make use of the back of your wall. How about installing drop down seats and tables or fold out awnings? Um, you own that wall. If you, if you have a terraced house, you own that wall, both sides of it at the bottom of your um, yard so it's something you can do right away even starting small by painting your own gates a really bright color um so you can look out for the wonderful bench prototype that neil campbell to mention him for a third time uh, made for us to demonstrate the concept as part of lemon alley and should say these sketches are all by ashley madden studio editor and how about openable gates like public rights of way we've been loving our walks around the entries watching them grow and introducing festoon lights like we saw in the open armo pick a few slides back Uh, this one is called Doesn't It Feel Safe and Wild and Lovely Here? Uh, we've been working with social farms and gardens to understand what is possible in terms of planting and growing in alleyways. And so this is exploring the idea of using planting to discourage the antisocial behaviour of climbing walls. So prickly, prickly plants like Irish blackthorn, paracantha and barbarous can be grown to stop people wanting to clamber. Uh, and the other thing we've done here is put gravel down. The idea of, you know, if you have a muddy, unadopted alley or grassy, just putting gravel down can stop you having muddy feet, but also make a sound that would, you know, let you know people were coming and perhaps deter antisocial behaviour. And then what if you named your alley or painted pictures on it? So as we've mentioned public art before, you'll see Laura Nelson's beautiful piece called Egress painted on a back gate along the route in Lemon Alley and also naming the alleys. We've been asking how naming a space can give it a sense of place. Think of alleyways like Lockdown Lane and Wildflower Alley. And we've been working with the research team at the Northern Ireland Place Names Project at Queen's University of Belfast to find out how places are named. And they've been helping us think about naming patterns for alleyways. We're absolutely delighted to share this uh, development with you as part of the exhibition. It's been beautifully designed by graphic artist Pauline Clancy. So, um, Professor Michal O'Manion and Dr. Francis O'Kane selected the alley between Bathgate Drive and Ferguson and Drive to come up with names for. Michal is now going to speak for a few minutes on how they arrived at these possibilities for alleyway naming. Thanks very much, Ashling. Uh, yes, uh, the Northern Ireland Placing Project, which is based in Queens, has uh, been doing research on Northern Ireland Placing since 1987. But this was, to be honest, a new development for us because we never had to consider before naming spaces in urban places. Uh, uh, places that they never had a name before. And I've, I must say that I found this a very uh, interesting challenge. So we tried to come up with some strategies for how uh, one might name uh, alleyways. Uh, and some of them are linguistic strategies and some of them are other things. And some of them are very, very clear and self-explanatory. Uh, so there are uh, eight pains, if you like, here. And uh, I'm going to go through them. Some of them will take only a moment or two. Uh, others I'll dwell on a little longer because they might require a little bit more explaining. Uh, so the, the various strategies that we sort of came up with for naming uh, involve uh, a mixture of languages. Uh, they involve multilingualism. They involve other, what you might call linguistic strategies, but which are not to do with particularly the English language or the Irish language, it's Scots and Ulster Scots language, but which are about employing other strategies for forming names. 
so well, let's have a look at some of these then. Uh, the uh, first one on the top left-hand side, McFergus's Gate, is what one might call a hybrid name. Now, this will become a little bit clearer when I compare it to the last one on the top row, which we'll see has three name forms in it. Ferguson Alley, which is English. Ferguson Gate, which is Ulster Scots. Gate being a Scots word uh, for alley, uh, but obviously related to the word gate. And uh, the Irish form, Cúlsarádsvig Argus, which is simply a translation of Ferguson Alley and Ferguson Gate into Irish. So in the case of uh, the one on the far right at the top then, you have a trilingual naming, uh, employing the three indigenous languages, if you like, in, in Northern Ireland, or the three languages that have been historically spoken here, Irish, English, and Scots, now Ulster Scots. Uh, and uh, now that we are armed with that knowledge, we can understand MacFergus's gate on the far uh, left a little bit better, because this is actually is a hybrid and a mixture of all three. So Mac, of course, is the Irish name, which we get often in Irish and Scottish surnames, uh, meaning son, of course. Uh, and Fergus, of course, is also a Gaelic name found in both Ireland and Scotland. Uh, Carrick Fergus is a good example, of course, in our place named landscape here in County Antrim. Uh, and indeed, Fergus is supposed to have been the person who brought uh, the Gaelic language to Scotland from Ireland originally back in the fifth century, but that's another story. So we have uh, Ferguson in this name being translated back, if you like, into an original Gaelic form, MacFergus. But Fergus itself was spelled not so much in the original Gaelic way, but in, 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 the, in the more common English fashion. And gate then is the Scots element, because the Gaelic language in Scotland and the Scots language in Scotland are two different languages. The Gaelic language spoken in the Highlands is a close relative of Irish, and the Scots language spoken in the Lowlands is a close relative of English, of course, and it is the parent of what we call Ulster Scots here. So McFergus's gate then is a hybrid, a mixture of all those three languages. And then we have other strategies. We have uh, strategies, for example, like Bath Fergus, which is a portmanteau name, which is a, a name formation which is really derived from adding uh, components of different words together. So uh, what we used here was the, the two alleyways, Bathgate and uh, Ferguson's Alley to combine uh, to make a new name, Bath Fergus, or, or Ferguson Street, I should say, or Road, to combine a new name, Bath Fergus. Uh, the one beside it on the, uh, just to the uh, right at the bottom, Bathfer Alley, is, is something uh, different. It's taking the initial components of the two uh, road names, which the alley runs between, and combining them into one in the same way as one takes the initials of, for example, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization to uh, make uh, an acronym, NATO. So Baffer Alley is a sort of an acronym. Uh, Cumber, Ballygown, and Money Ray alleys are names which are derived from, uh, alley names which are derived from other names in, close by in County Down. So we could, of course, often have patterns in city uh, landscapes of names deriving from uh, neighboring places in the country. And if you like, those names are transferred into the city and employed in the creation of new street, road, or in this case, alley names. We can have also names which in the city which can be thematic. In other words, they can form around a connection uh, in that part of the city with something of great importance, whether it be economically or, or socially, whatever else it may be. Obviously in Belfast, the uh, shipyard, Farland and Wolf, has obviously a great impact historically. So this idea here is drawing on that concept of uh, uh, naming alleys from, if you like, what is the dominant economic uh, and socioeconomic historical component of East Belfast, and that is the shipyard. So we have Shipyard Alley, Titanic Alley, White, White Star Alley, all connected to the shipyard and to the names of its most famous ships. Uh, and then uh, finally, we have commemorative names which simply commemorate somebody who was of importance to the local community, who was somebody famous, uh, whether that be in more contemporary times, Georgie Best, or in the further back in the 19th century, Mary Ann McCracken. So you can draw on the names of famous people too to name streets and roads, and in this case, alleys. So it was just uh, an attempt, therefore, on our part to, to employ some strategies and think about some ways that one might form new names for alleys which haven't previously existed. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michal. It's so rich. We have just really enjoyed this uh, collaboration. We're so keen to investigate this idea further. Um, we hope you'll all be naming your alleyways now. And I see in the chat as Michal was talking, people talking about the 
rainbow alley name, which is the most you could say another strategy is like capturing the zeitgeist the bird of a moment and naming it after that. So the rainbows and lockdown. Um, we're just disappointed that, that you guys didn't uh, choose to use the Bali Smugger Alley that we came up, that Francis helped to come up with, which is the, uh, I'm only joking by the way, but uh, Francis explained to us, it combines the words for a word, something to do with alley from Scots, Irish and English together. So it's basically alley, 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 oi, oi, oi. Um, so we're working on one more concept around play and connection, which isn't yet finished. So watch this space. And then we're also interested in the alleys yeah, and English. pardon? Did... Yeah, can you hear me? No? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, we're also interested in the alleys at this wider city scale um, and a report by the city of Seattle claims that their city alleys have the potential to increase public space by a massive 50%. So we've mapped them all. These are um, the Belfast alleyways. On the, on the left here you can see the entire map. Um, this map contains public information that has never before been made public on this scale. And we're hoping that by making this very difficult to find information public, it will encourage more people to become interested in their alleyway, either on this local scale or as part of the wider city infrastructure. And this map shows roads to get your bearings. Um, you can see the uh, zoomed in version on the right. And here it is then without the roads on it. Uh, yet the traces of recognizable roads are still evident in the formation of the alleys, if you know the city well enough. Imagine for a minute then that all of these alleys were open places and by using them, we could navigate the city safely and quietly. We've shown the parks and greenways on here to sort of fully get that picture across. Um, and imagine that your task was to map the alleys of Belfast, which is what Katie Stringer and Ashley Madden at Studio Editor have, have been uh, doing the last few months just to explain the colors there and um, the ones that are black are the gated alleys that we spoke about so there they are adopted alleys with Belfast City Council gates the brown colored ones are adopted but don't have gates and then the green are all the un unadopted ones some of which have unofficial gates and we have this live web version of the map. So this is all, um, it's just all gone live on our website, um, which is nine foot in common. Uh, we made a version of the map uh, yesterday on our site. Dr. Connor McCafferty has created this and the website for us and is going to talk you through it in one moment. And this is our final slide. So um, on the left, you can see how we've taken the Belfast Alley map and uh, we've used it in identifying locations for Limon Alley. Um, we encourage you to explore the, silly, the city's alleyways using the Belfast Alley map. So please get in touch with any alleyway stories and for further reasoning to get out there, um, you can download this poster from the website to investigate Limon Alley this weekend. I'm going to hand over to Connor McCafferty now. Um, Connor, are you here? I'm here, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and hopefully Connor can take us through the Belfast Alley map, which is on the website, just to give you a little bit of a feel for how you might use it. Uh, thanks, Amberly. Uh, so yeah, I've been involved uh, in the project just for the past few months, uh, just to help out with the, the project website um, and the and just getting all this amazing material online. And um, so hopefully I can share a screen and just talk you through um, the map on the site. Uh, it's hopefully, you know, user friendly enough that you're able to just get, you know, dive right in there and, and, and figure out yourself, but just to give you a flavor. Uh, so the website URL is ninefootincommon.com. Um, uh, it's just a fairly simple site. And we've got um, the journal that uh, Amberly and Ashley were talking about, uh, loads of 
fantastic stuff on there, all their different conversations with different people about alleys all across the city. Uh, there's a list of the events um, and there's, you know, you can contact uh, them as well. But uh, I just wanted to show you the actual alley map page, which just went live yesterday. Um, so there's just a bit of an introduction and then there's two versions on the site. Um, so the alley map that you've seen that Ashley talked about without the roads on it. Um, and if you click through that, it'll open it up um, in a new tab that you can uh, kind of zoom in on a bit better to see in more detail. Um, and that's, I think that's just like, it's kind of endless fun just looking around the city and seeing um, where all the different types of alleys are and they kind of cluster in different kind of areas around the city. It's really interesting to, to, to view. Um, and there's a little key at the bottom left of that map to show you the different colors that um, uh, Ashton was talking about there. And then as Amberly was mentioning during the talk there, it explains what the different types of alleys are. And then uh, we have the interactive version um, of the alley map then as well. And just quite simply, um, I'll, I should be able to make this kind of more full screen. Yeah, and if I move everybody's faces out of the way. <laughs> uh, so you, uh, this is just an interactive Google map uh, with all the alleys overlaid. And there's a little um, uh, kind of toggle over on the right where you can switch everything on and off. So uh, if you switch on uh, the adopted alleys, you can see where they overlay across the city um, and you can kind of zoom in to see uh, in a bit more detail which streets they come off. Uh, the, all the BCC gated, the ones that have been gated by the city council appear then in, in darker, uh, in the kind of black shade, uh, the unadopted ones kind of more green, and the city centre ones have their own um, uh, kind of toggle as well, you can switch them on and off. And then another key feature of the site that's just kind of started um, and it's kind of going to build up over time is the stories toggle. So we've just added a handful of stories um, to the site so far, to the map so far I should say. Um, and these are stories that Amberly and Ashling uh, have been collecting from people all over um, uh, the city. And I think uh, they can tell you, but I think there's something like there's over 100 stories at this stage that have already been collected. So we started small with seven, <laughs> just as kind of proof of concept and to get it going. Uh, but uh, it's nice that as well, there's kind of a range across the city too. Uh, and it comes from residents who just wanted to tell people about, you know, what was significant about their rally, both, you know, positive and negative. Uh, and there's also, you know, stuff about, for example, Lemon Alley uh, happening on Ormer Road and the Belmont Road um, alleys as well. So you can just click through that. I mean, I think everybody at this stage knows how a Google map works, uh, hopefully, but that's where you get to it. If you go to nightfootandcommon.com and click through um, to Belfast Alley map, um, that's how you get to it. So I'll just stop sharing there. Connor, thanks so much. That's brilliant. Very well explained. Um, and of course, you can find um, Nine Foot in Common on Instagram and on Twitter as well. It's just at Nine Foot in Common. But now we're going to hand over to Maeve, um, who's going to tell us a little bit um, about what she's been doing as curator of Lemon Alley. Oh, wow. Um, after such a fascinating and interesting presentation, I feel even more nervous than I did before. So, um, right, let's give this a go. Um, thank you everybody for coming. Um, share screen. And I want to go this one. And then I don't know. No. Sorry, I don't think I put the right one. Um, I almost got a view. Uh, stop share. Sorry, I almost got to the pandemic without um, 
giving a talk on Zoom. Okay, can everybody Yay, see you that? Got it, Maeve. Yep. Yay, thank you. All right, so as I said, thank you so much for coming. And um, this has been really exciting um, lockdown in, in many ways. So I just wanted to start with a little bit of um, information about me. Uh, my name is Maeve McElgarham. I'm originally from Dublin. Um, I moved up to Belfast in 2015 um, to do a master's in Queens in their arts management course. And I guess I have stayed. But my background before that and my sort of artistic practice um, comes from a sort of craft practice with uh, glass making being special in my studies in undergrad. Um, my work tends to be very, my, my own personal work tends to be very delicate and kind of ephemeral and usually really breakable. So um, you can see some images of some pieces uh, on the slide there. I guess with that as my own sort of work, I've never been very interested in, in stuff that just sort of is made and stays the same. And on the other side of things, I um, have been working for the last five years in, in arts admin and sort of cultural management, I guess. So doing exhibitions and running events is something that's been a really big part of my life. So in a way, um, running the exhibition Liminal Space Belfast and Lemon Alley is kind of a coming together of both sides of my artistic um, practice. So I'm gonna try and skip this slide. And I know we touched on the other exhibition a little bit earlier, but I wanted to give a little bit about how that came about. Um, so, in the weird limbo of lockdown one, um, the Arts Council of Northern Ireland released their first artist emergency grant. And in that strange place of no one knows what they're going to do and who knows what is going to come next and everything was closed and it was really weird, I decided and I had a bit of time to make an application as an individual artist, which is the first time I've done something like that. And I had dreamed up, why not use the entries as an exhibition space. Um, ideas don't come out of nowhere, however. So, can I get to the next slide? Yeah, I wanted to acknowledge some people who have to play a role in how that came about. So the first image in the top corner there is um, from Sharon Adams is five artists in a buyer. Sharon moved back to Northern Ireland and has been curating exhibitions in a buyer um, in her outbuildings in, in her on her properties outbuildings in Clock Mills for the last number of years. I think this one is from the 2017 show called Five Artists in a Buyer. It's always really special and it's so interesting to see um, art in this sort of rural context and contemporary applied art and craft in particular. Um, the other person who was doing some similar stuff uh, that I have to acknowledge is Anna Donovan, who's one of our artists um, in both of the exhibitions um, back in October and this one, who ran an exhibition called Love, which stood for Lockdown Outdoor Virtual Exhibition um, last year in her back garden. You can see some of her ceramics um, nicely displayed in the sunshine. Um, then the other thing is and Amber, I won't talk too much about it, but Amberly and Ashling already mentioned um, the amazing street art that we have in Belfast. I also particularly love the entries project that Daisy Chain Inc. and Steelhead Arts have run in the city centre, particularly because they weren't just um, really big uh, pieces of street art and painted murals and things that, that we might see all over the city, but there was also like the picture on the right, a lot of um, smaller bits that I think they call like Easter eggs to sort of hunt you, uh, to encourage you to sort of look around and question things differently. Um, the, the large image is one we saw before is by Rob Hilkin and I think the, the smaller one is by an artist called Peter Strain. So there's all these things that were happening and uh, there's a lot more influences. So when I say I dreamed up the idea of putting on an exhibition in the entries, um, I think I have to acknowledge while I did dream it up and say that would be a bit mad, made an application. Um, 
And then somehow it got funding. So then I had to do it. And that was a whole other challenge. Um, but I do want to acknowledge some of these other things that have been really an influence on even coming up with the idea of doing it in the first place. So um, the first exhibition ran in the alley behind my house in October in 2020 um, as a result of this Arts Council grant. It was a very, very small pilot and I invited um, five other artists who were friends of mine to come and exhibit in it. It literally lasted four hours, um, but took an amazing amount of work <laughs> but to go into it by, by, by everybody. And also, um, you know, from, from a kind of coordination point of view, I think lockdown has really shown us that in terms of exhibitions and things, having really good evidence of it online, it didn't matter that it was four hours as opposed to four weeks, um, because you still got all of those you know, it still happened, it was still valid, whether or not people could come, it was in the middle of sort of October's mini lockdown, whether or not people came in person or whether they engaged with it online, it didn't really matter. People were still experiencing work and it was certainly really, um, really special to, to be able to put that on in the middle of lockdown when people hadn't really been able to go to galleries or go to museums for so many months. Um, I'm just of time, so these, Beautiful pictures are by, guess it, Bill Campbell, um, amazing photographer and maker of stuff. Here's some other um, images. The work, oh, I'll just go back one slide there. Um, the projection image is by Kathy Scullion. The ceramics is from Anna Donovan. Um, these prints here with the barbed wire that was just there um, are by Raquel, and these glass mirror things are from myself. So I want to make sure that we have time for questions. Um, in the course of putting on this exhibition, I got a slightly worried message, I think, from Amberly going, oh my God, we've just found your project. And um, we have completely concurrent, like, you know, separately been running this, but I hadn't heard of Nine Foot in Common. Um, and we had ended up using the same kind of spaces, talking about how these entries are quite liminal, they're quite transitory, and um, they have so much potential. So the same language that I was describing was the sort of language that they were using in their research. Um, I hadn't thought too much about it. I'd seen, um, you know, I'd seen some of the community stuff that had happened, but. I wasn't aware of what they had done. So they were like, can we come and can we come to the event and can we come and see it? So that was the first time we, we sort of met and started having a chat. I was really interested in what they were talking about. And I was like, oh, this could be really cool. They really enjoyed the event. And we said, oh, we should try and do something together. Um, kind of the way you say things and then you don't expect that they will actually happen. But lo and behold, the Imagine Festival got in touch with me from seeing the event online. Again, why it doesn't matter whether it existed for four, <laughs> for four hours or for four weeks, because people can still sort of find it if, it if it's an interesting concept, which is pretty amazing. And Pete, who I don't think is here, he's probably been at loads of other events, but he sent me a message and said, would you be interested in putting on something on for the festival? And I went, Absolutely, but I think I want to change up the format of it. Um, and I had in the back of my head that I would really want to use some of what Amberly and Ashling had been finding out and some of what they were developing. And we started having some conversations and saying, okay, well, how can we make this less about a pop-up exhibition in an alternative space, but use art and design as an incentive for people to start um, exploring these spaces. So that brings us to now. <laughs> I'm really delighted that we have, oops, not go on to that one just yet, or will I? I will, time's running out. But I'm really delighted to have, of the five artists that I had join me in the first one, I've carried forward three of them. The other two couldn't um, commit for their own, just had other things going on, that's fine. But then I've grown it by, I'm so bad at numbers, but in total there's 12. I didn't want to make a really bad addition um, mistake there on camera, but now I've probably just made it worse. <laughs> anyway, so including myself, there's now 12 artists involved in this project. 
and um, from photography to I'm going to read out all their names so I don't forget one. But yes, we have Aaron Dixon, Karis Wilson, Donald Billings, Joe Laverty, Jonathan Brennan, Susan Hughes, Anna Donovan, Laura Nelson, Neil Campbell, Patrick Colloon, Pauline Clancy, and me. And as well as the concepts and prototypes and projects provided by Nine Foot in Common. So here are some sneaky peeks from our photographer that was taken just today. Um, I'm really tired because it's been a really long day uh, installing. But here we have Jonathan and Joe installing their work this morning. And here's some little teasers. I didn't really want to give everything away in this talk because I want you to actually go out and see them yourself if you can, or follow us on social media. I'll put links in the chat if you're not able to actually make it um, up to Belfast to see them for yourself, because I think, you know, just seeing the beautiful photography shots is one thing. Um, these all these pictures are by Simon Mills, by the way. Um, but that's one thing, whereas, you know, actually going and seeing them in real life, walking through these spaces, spotting all those other things that um, the concept posters that we talked about earlier, perhaps you'll even be able to play wildfire bingo or note how many doors have been painted or not. So here's a little teaser. Please, if you can have a look, after the exhibition is um, finished on Sunday, we will be putting a lot more information up on the website around each piece, what inspired it, and more things like, and a good, a good amount of images. But for now, go see them in real life, because it's better. And I think, oh yeah, here's one more. I want time for questions, but before we finish this, I wanted to mention a couple of things that can go wrong. Um, I've definitely learned a lot from doing the first one and then doing this one, but the context is very different. And anytime you've got stuff in public spaces, um, there's definitely a risk. So everyone was aware of that when they joined. Um, unfortunately, this beautiful piece called By Your Absent, um, which Anna put installed today, got destroyed um, within two hours of putting it up, which is really sad. So you can't see it. But we're going to uh, make some kind of memorial for it. So if you do go hunting around tomorrow, um, you mightn't see this as beautifully as it is here. But I felt really sad for Anna, so I wanted to mention that. And I think that just kind of goes with the territory of putting stuff out in public. You don't know what's going to happen. and. Uh, you kind of hope that people will sort of respect it and come on board with you. We've definitely had to do a lot of work with, um, you know, making sure residents are okay, putting people posters, telling them to get in touch, making sure that everyone knows what's going on. But when the events get bigger and bigger, you know, you're bound to miss some people. So yeah, it's all been a learning curve. And thank you very much, I guess. I think I'm gonna let somebody else talk. Thank you so much, Maeve. That was really fascinating and uh, a poignant end. Um, I wanted to just quickly comment. Yeah, I was thinking as you were speaking and particularly with the sense piece, it was really uh, like, I really love what you said about the value of the four hour exhibition because it was photographed a bit like out, outliving, far outliving the four hours that that first exhibition was on for. In my head, I feel like it was a much longer thing. We were obviously only there for 20 minutes. Um, but there's something about that. Uh, the that like the value of something ephemeral like that that makes me think about the, the walking walking as well as a way to experience the space like we've been doing in the alleys that it's it, it sort of has a value way beyond the moment that you're actually experiencing it and hopefully there's some comfort then for Anna and her piece that even though it only lasted for two hours it's still living on in the photographs and the traces of it yeah absolutely I mean it's especially in in the age of the internet or whatever like you know the value of photography and documenting and having sort of some, somewhere that you can put things like that is really so important and I mean I guess that was something that was hammered into me from art college as well because if you're going to make stuff that is stupidly delicate and probably won't survive you better have good photos of it. <laughs> Absolutely 
Um, to pick to anybody, does anybody have any questions from the floor? Please feel free to raise your little Zoom hand or just turn off your mic if you're able to do that. Are they able to do that? Or you could type into the um, chat box as well and we can answer questions or comments. Um, yeah, we'd love to hear what, what you thought. And has anyone actually, has anyone got anything to share? Has anybody been to Lemon Alley yet and seen the work in the alleys? Still got three days. Okay. Um, okay. Hmm. Well, I guess if, I have, if there... I have a question for oh, Maeve. If, okay. Um, Go for um, it, Ashley. What's, what's, uh, what's next, Maeve? <laughs> Um, oh yeah, that's that's actually that there is a next. So um, after the first exhibition, another opportunity landed that couldn't go ahead then, um, which was Arts Arts Art Centre. Got in touch saying that they had a gap in their program because obviously a lot of reschedules around program uh, around uh, COVID and stuff have been happening. So that was due to happen in hmm, I can't remember because all time has. Blend, blended together but uh they the, the same thing is happening again so we should actually be having an exhibition in like a real gallery um of probably both of the exhibitions at this stage so I'm kind of looking at it as a way to sort of consolidate them a little bit and maybe like reflect on some of them like to include some work but maybe also just showcase what the what the shows look like because a lot of the stuff was quite maybe site specific or the the context of it being in an alley it was it was made for an alley so it wouldn't really work in a gallery but maybe concentrating on showing the sort of documentation um i also yeah liminal space belfast might not always be about alleys in terms of an exhibition concept like i was interested in um exhibiting in, in places that in, in between places so it could be a physical space or it, it could be something else I'm not quite sure what it is but um yeah that that could probably change too did that answer your question great yeah really fascinated to see where you take it uh, kind of it's funny it's funny to imagine that translated to a gallery like do you think it would be you know, do you think it'll be a completely different experience, those, those works in a gallery environment rather than a urban gritty environment? Yeah, I think, well, I think it will be very different. Um, so that's why I don't think a lot of them will work the same way or read the same way. Um, and because it, it it's grown so much, I think I'll have to kind of put, you know, rather than have multiple pieces from each person, I'll, I'll have to sort of curate it a bit more. But I think and I hope that you can be involved in it too in some type of reflection-y, writing-y thing. Um, but it's it's nice to have, I, I think as an artist, like having an exhibition, like if you have an exhibition of your, of your own work or like a solo show type thing, um, it is a chance to sort of reflect on, okay, you've done all this thing. What does it all mean or how are you presenting it? So in a way, it will be a group show, but as the curator, it will be my chance to sort of go back on what was there, pick out a few things, have a look and see what what what, what I want to take forward. But yeah, um, I just see someone in the chat there saying, um, yeah, have we you ha thought about working outside of Belfast? Or, yeah, um, yes, is the answer to that. Not necessarily with with alleys but exhibitions in between spaces I think it, you know that could that could go into a lot of a lot of different things um the alleyways really for me which I forgot to say in my earlier slide because I panicked um living in the city and living in a rented house I didn't have like you don't have a back garden you have a very very tiny yard so seeing all those other people you know the, the street arts and uh the exhibitions and gardens and own uh, and the buyer and things like that um I really started looking at the yard and going okay well I can't really do anything with that where else can I go so 
that was what drew me to the alley initially and then it sort of built from there but yeah I would absolutely love to do things in other places just I mean logistically it could be quite difficult I guess in terms of nine foot in common research as well um Ashleen We've considered working outside of Belfast and our, um, we have looked at other cities that we think are quite similar to Belfast with the alleyways. And we've deliberately made the findings from our research or presented them in such a way that they are transferable to other cities. Um, so we've not been very specific with, with Belfast um, whenever we're presenting our concepts for example and um, because we think that people from all over can if you've got an alleyway then you can be inspired by this project which links quite nice, nicely to Ian's question in the chat here about whether the Belfast alleys are particular to the city or are all alleys similar and the interesting thing because we're funded by an English organization um, we've had a lot of conversations about be, being like informed about other things going on in alleys in the north of England and I think because Belfast is a city, industrial city. I think it has, there are a lot of probably very similar alleys and very similar, behind very similar red brick terraces in the north of England. But I was having a conversation with somebody in Dublin from Architecture Ireland last week and realising that on the island of Ireland, it's maybe a little more unique to have this, um, so many, so many red brick terraces with their alleys out the back as we do here. Of course, like Irish, lots of Irish cities and towns have Muse and lanes and um you know of some description but I think maybe I correct me if I'm wrong but I don't know that there's anywhere else on this island that has as many I Derry we had some interesting conversations about some of the ones in Derry particularly ones that sort of are um crossed over by a peace wall or either side of a peace wall and stuff which which we are we're fascinated by um but yeah I hope that answers that question Amberly did you want to take Jonathan um, well, I was thinking you could answer, Jonathan. So um, in mm. your research, did you come across anyone living in a house backing onto an alley who was against a city council gate? Ashleen, you lived in a house with a, <laughs> with a gate on the alley. Do you want to talk about it? Well, I can't. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, my last house uh, on Adelaide Avenue, we had, there were gates put on while we lived there. And I was not a fan. It was a bit of a faff getting your bin in and out and just ha only having one key in your house and who had it. Um, and then after I left there as an architect, I went to do a like, you know, client meeting in a house on the Lisburn Avenue, the next street, and had the smart idea, knowing the alley, because I, uh, knowing things other people had done, was like, why don't we leave out the back gate? The estate agent locked us out when we we'll go and look at some of these other things people have done at the back of their houses. And uh, only to discover the estate agent had left and we got ourselves locked in the alley. I didn't live there anymore, didn't have a key. So quite embarrassingly, had to phone the woman who had bought my house and <laughs> let us out through her living room where she had where she was uh, entertaining people, thankfully before lockdown. Um, so I don't like I don't like them. But actually, we've met quite a quite we've spoken to quite a lot of people that are not a fan of gates. Um, people who've do, who've like transformed their alleys over this last year without having gates. Um, uh, yeah, I would say there's there's quite a mix, but the, but when you speak to councillors because they're representing what they're being asked for, there's like there's certainly a big demand for gates as well. So we're hoping that our concepts and this conversation can help people see that there are alternatives to putting big locked gates on your alleys. Um, we've got one minute left, I think. Um, Kieran is asking, are you planning to? Work with any communities to pilot some interventions. Yes, Kieran, we've got some pilots happening this weekend um, as part of Lemon Alley. So we're piloting some um, of our concepts there and we're going to see how they go. And potentially in the future, we can branch out a little bit more. Maybe we should talk to you about that. Um, weirdest thing you spotted on your research trips and did you find any haunted alleyways? Two questions. Yeah, Maeve and I had a pretty interesting uh, alley experience in the one, the unadopted one off, um, what do you call the street? I'm living right beside it, so I should remember. It begins with B, out the back of the Ormo Bakery. Um, there was one that comes down round in a U shape. Rachel O'Grady knows it as well. She's here, I don't know if she is. But um, there were, it was like a, there were some little creepy plastic dolls on top of a wall and a dinosaur and a whole load of really exotic plants because apparently somebody who used to live in one of those houses when they left Burma that's the one thank you very much uh, 
threw a load of their plants into the alley and then left. So there's like all of these things you'd never expect to find. Uh, you would get a complete jackpot on the wildflower bingo if you went down that alley. That's our weirdest. What about yours, Amberly? Um, that's yeah, that's pretty weird. I don't know. I was just I wasn't really thinking that. I suppose that could account for the weirdest and the haunted alley. Are there any plans to do any more projects in alleyways? Um, watch the space, Jacqueline. Uh, keep in keep in touch with us over social media. I think. Um, and oh, there's a message, not a question from Connor McCafferty. Shop is live. Connor, is that on the website? <laughs> we so we have some yeah. we have some items <laughs> for sale, and um, we were we were trying to get the shop and the website set up for this event and it wasn't coming together. So um, Connor has somehow miraculously, whilst this event was happening, set a shop up. So there you go, we'll end. You can all fill your shopping carts and, <laughs> and that's it. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks yeah, thank everyone. You, everybody. I don't know if anyone thank can you. hear Good night. My Enjoy Lemon Alley. <laughs> Go see. Good night. Please visit the exhibition. Um, and thank you so much to the Imagine Festival for um, having us and including us and supporting us so well. And also to the Arts Council who funded it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.